two or three year old as a series of conversations with Christian brothers and sisters considering their efforts and contributions to the kingdom vocationally, their stories and testimony of God's sovereignty and grace, and an opportunity to tackle the relevant issues the church faces in the 21st century. In this, we seek to equip the saints by networking within the body, starting the conversation around often taboo subjects and seeking to develop unity across Christian denominations and traditions by opening up uh, discussion on worthy and necessary topics. We want to help educate the wider body of Christ by asking experts and people of wisdom across multiple fields the hot button questions and sophisticated questions that we believe there are answers for in Christ Church, but that there is not necessarily always access to. We want to further the growth of knowledge and wisdom in ourselves, to worship God with our minds and fellowship with all of you as we collectively seek to discern what God-glorifying discipleship looks like for us in our respective vocations and in our spheres of influence. It is our heart and hope that Christ himself would be in our midst as we converse about things we believe he himself is very interested in. Welcome to or Threes. Thank you for gathering with us. Welcome to or three gathered. Um, thank you for joining us today on our podcast. We are honoured to have here with us today AJ Hendry. Um, we are honoured. We are really glad you came along. We know how busy you are from everything I see online. I don't understand how you get time to do anything in your life. Um, AJ is known to some of us um, through people. I went to church with AJ many years ago. Um, he is a former Laidlaw Bachelor of Theology graduate, as the rest of us also are. Um, he is summer, uh, <laughs> husband to summer, not summer to husband, um, and <laughs> father to Wesley Martin and Lewis. Um, so I knew AJ at Massey Community Church, so that is in West Auckland, um, proud Westies. And oh, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we see a lot of AJ online because He's so passionate about um, youth work, uh, getting really involved in the community, um, using his faith to uh, kind of head a lot of social justice causes, um, youth well-being, homelessness, mental health. Um, there's a lot of intersection with politics and culture and youth work. Um, you have also been part of Gosh, there's a whole list of stuff here. Manaki Rangatahi, am I saying that right? Um, LifeWise Youth Housing Leader, Massey Community mm -hmm. Trust Board member, um, recent work as a collaborator on the Safety Net Project. Um, he's been on so many things as a public speaker and media and politics and radio and councils and churches and TVs and podcasts and community gatherings. Man, we're making you sound like you're a superstar because you really are when it comes to all this stuff. Um, you write um, when lambs are silent. Um, you do a whole lot of posts about love is the way. I mean, there's just so much we can unpack about what you do that it was quite a mission for us to actually narrow down what we wanted to talk to you about because there are so many rabbit holes we could go down. Um so basically what we want to look at with AJ um, is, first of all, we would really love to unpack how you got to the place that you are now. So how, first of all, how did you get to Laidlaw? Like how did your faith bring you to studying theology? And then how did studying theology bring you to where you are now with your politics and your community work and everything like that? And so after we've kind of chatted about that, then we'd like to delve more into like, um, what you're actually doing these days and, um, and, you know, your, your work for, I mean, we see it as an outworking of the church, even if it's not within a church. Um, and yeah, just basically what you're up to because there's so much there. So welcome AJ. Thank you for being here with us. Kia ora. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a real honor to be with you all. <laughs> Stop it. So nice. So nice. <laughs> so nice. So nice. Um, okay. So, AJ, we're basically going to open the floor up to you and just chuck in questions whenever we feel like it. But mm, cool. um, really, we would love to hear your journey of faith mm -hmm. and and what brought you to Laidlaw and then from Laidlaw on, what, how did that theology then form what you do now? So, take it away, mate. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, 
Yeah, well, call Aaron Hindry, well, AJ Hindry, Toko Ingo. Um, I'm Tangata Tereriti. Um, mm. I, yeah, I grew up in a sort of largest family, seven kids, um, out sort of actually far west, sort of Riverhead Coastful. Uh, oh, we wow. grew up in a little, little place out there with, um, sort of my wider Fano, my, you know, grandparents and uncles and aunties and cousins. And, um, but yeah, West Auckland, Massey specifically has always really been my home where I'm really connected. Um, mm. In terms of in terms of my faith journey, like faith has been a big part of my life um, since I was a kid. Um, I'd probably say, yeah, and though we didn't really talk about it in this way back then, and it's far more popular to now. Um, but uh, you know, I'd probably say it's probably far more like an evangelical, conservative uh, Christian tradition um, that I kind of came through, um, and a very uh, yeah, and Pentecostal. So I kind of grew up going to quite a large Pentecostal church in the city as well. Um, which had, you know, an impact on my faith. Um, but, you know, I guess probably the, the biggest influence on my faith was my mother. Uh, she is someone who, you know, really taught, I think, the core of her faith was that, you know, God is about love and acceptance and, and love for others. Um, and even though she had like a real, quite a traditional theology in that um, her praxis and the way she actually lived was one of embrace. Um, and she really sh demonstrated to me what it means to really love others and care for others really well. Um, can you can you think of any like examples off the top of your head, like when you mm -hmm. say she really lived that for you? Like, yeah, is there anything I mean, that kind of stands out to you? Yeah, uh, those who who listen to this and know my mother will will just know she is just someone that just um, that just kind of has that 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 wider of acceptance, right? She's that person that would be, you know, staying late after church because uh, someone needed a shoulder to cry on, or you know, you know, going out to to catch up with someone who just needed someone to be there for them, and you know, spending hours just you know providing that support and that empathy and that care. Mm. Um, someone who's just just deeply compassionate and, and caring, you know. Um, so what yeah, they, I, I don't know if I have like a, a specific sort of like uh, time or moment, yeah. but you know, that's mm. just sort mm. of uh, I guess what I gleaned from her. Um, yeah, and that just was a real focus. Is. Yeah, yeah, just who one, she is. One of the real focus one of the pastoral God, one of the pastoral support team without the title, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. she had that's seven awesome. kids, right? So she was uh, a <laughs> bit of a superhero and still caring for others mm. outside of that. Wow. Um, what brought me? I mean, I, you know, growing up, I always had like a real deep, deep faith. You know, I, I really um, loved God. We, we grew up in a situation where, you know, like Alfano wasn't. Um, we weren't wealthy, you know, I, I'd say, you know, we experienced poverty. There were times where, um, you know, we didn't have anything, you know, I remember stories where mum, uh, was starving herself just so that we could eat, you know, um, that was a sort of environment where things were really tight and really difficult. Um, and, and a lot of our, our journey was around like just trusting in God that something would happen, you know, that dad would find, you know, some work or, you know, get some sort of, you know, something through so that we'd be able to survive for the next week. And that was kind of our life. Um, in terms of my journey to, to laid law, um, yeah, I grew up, you know, as I said, in, in, in quite a Pentecostal tradition and, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's definitely things from that, that, um, that I take with me that I still hold on to today. Um, but there's another side of that, that, that never kind of felt, you know, sat right with me. And, um, you know, I remember kind of on my journey, there I was starting to do some work with young people sort of in my local community and starting to see the reality of their lives you know what was kind of really going on for them um and I remember one one morning sort of sitting in church um and you know in this large you know in this large building and and and, and the theology was very triumphant you know it was about you know how Christ was on the mountain and, you know, just, you know, pray this and you, you're going to be healed and saved and redeemed and all these things. And I was like, well, that's not like my experience, you know, mm. wherever I've experienced mm. God, it's been in the gutters. Um, mm. It's been with those who have been mm. marginalized, those who suffer, you know, when God's mm. turned up for me, it's been in the hardest times and it's mm. never been easy or, you know, cookie cutter. Um, it's never been clean. And, and sometimes, you know, that naming claiming, you know, things don't happen, you know, you have yeah. disappointments mm. and suffering yeah. and, uh, it's crap. Uh, I don't know if I can say that. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no. You know, I, I you know, just, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, just do you. Kind of, <laughs> that was kind of the straw for me. Like, I, I had the sense that God was real, that the vine was real. I had those experiences as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, you, looking around me, I couldn't see anyone articulating, um, I guess, what I understood of who God was. Um, 
And, you know, I'd love for a scripture. I'd always read the, read, read the Bible sort of daily. Um, and I just didn't see it around me. And I was really interested. And as I started to read the scriptures as well and read about this, you know, um, about Jesus and the way that he cared for people and loved people and, you know, his real heart for justice and um, for those who suffered, I thought, you know, there's so much more to this faith than I understand um, and so much more than what I'm being taught, you know, and what I'm being taught often doesn't align with what I'm reading. And so that, mm -hmm. I guess, is what led me to Laidlaw. You know, I was, I was very interested in digging deeper into that, to understanding that. Um, and also believing that um, the separation that we have between faith and politics and justice and the, and the world we live doesn't have to be that way. And so I was very interested in kind of understanding um, how the gospel was relevant to our every day. How was it relevant to the suffering um, that, you know, I was seeing around me and, and the young people I was serving. Um, can I, can so I ask can... something? Oh, oh yeah, can I jump go. in there with a question? No, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, go for it, Jared. You might be <laughs> going to ask the same thing I'm going to ask. Think, so, yeah, yes, yeah, go for it. Same yeah, way, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, were there any people in your sphere and in your influence where you're kind of thinking, are oh, they modeling that kind of, you know, this is my faith, but I hold it in tandem with the thirst for justice, like kind of that marrying mm. of orthodoxy, but also orthopraxis. Like, was that something that you kind of came to organically in and of yourself or was it something it's like oh that person over there is doing that and they're doing that because of their faith that's kind of cool was that something that was do you uh, understand what i'm asking there yeah i think so i think um you know i think to be honest it was more the reading you know the reading of the gospels right that mm -hmm. really in getting to know jesus in those texts and kind of stepping back from the theological tradition i was around because yeah, um, wow. you know i grew up in a, in a family background we're really encouraged to read you know the scriptures and i was you know reading daily through the whole book since i was a kid right and the more i dug into um the text um the more what i was being taught um didn't make as much sense um and didn't really sort of show the jesus that i was getting to know um yeah so did you mm. see in in your um tradition that you grew up in were you seeing quite a uh disconnect between faith and politics and praxis and stuff like that like was that quite an obvious thing to you yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think even growing up in, in my circumstances, right, so we're in a quite a wealthy, affluent church um, mm. and, you know, experiencing what our mm. family was going through. Mm. Um, mm. And the only real answers and solutions to that were prayer, you know, yeah. or like right. a yeah. castle, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, just pray and then, like, give. And, yeah. you know, then maybe, like, you'll get, you know, that's our salvation, you know, and it was, right. it was very much focused. And then even around me outside of that Pentecostal tradition where I was connected in, in the more Protestant circles, it was still very much about, you know, say that sinner's prayer, get a good relationship with God, mm. very individualistic, very focused yeah. on sort of, you know, um, morality. And so when politics came into it, it was about morality. It was about mm. sort of this very defined mm. sense of Christian morality as mm. well. You know, like, these are the things that say that you're in and these are the things that say you're out and that's it. Um you know, and yet, you know, what I saw in Jesus was, was, you know, someone who was so much, so concerned with, with far more than just, you know, your head and your heart, but actually, you know, the physical conditions that people around him were living in. Mm. Um, and, and there was no disconnect between the spiritual and the physical and, and, and all of that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that, that kind of thirst for understanding and, and wanting to know scripture more led you to study theology. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a combination yeah. of all that. Um, I mean, I just really loved it, enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, it was an opportunity to go, and I uh, jumped into it. Yeah. Nice. Mm. So, what at Laidlaw? Like, if we look at your your eight years, you said you were studying mm. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I I spent seven. I feel your pain. <laughs> yeah. Five. <laughs> Sometimes it. We, yeah, we take a long <laughs> time to get through it. Um, yeah. So what? <laughs> Um, what about the what you studied at Laidlaw? Did you, um, I guess, what cemented for you um, and what you wanted to do? What challenged you? What did you disagree with? Like anything? I mean, if mm. anything, um, yeah. you know, how did how did that change who you were and the way that you approached your faith? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was another really defining period for me. Again, I came into this context where, um, you know, I think some of the same challenges I was having in my church context, I still had in the academic context. You know, I came mm. in and there was a lot of sort of very theoretical discussions around, you know, suffering and hope and all this sort of stuff. And like, I'd be going to to class during the day and then in the evening sitting with young men who had been abused and beaten and um, were thinking of ending their lives and thinking like, like, you know, what does it mean to say that Christ is here with this young man and his suffering? You know, I, I'm here with him for an hour and I'm going to send him back to a home where he's unsafe. Like, what does that mean? And and um, I think around me, I didn't see a lot of those conversations happening, but it really challenged me as I was doing my theological reflection and my studies to think, well, this has to be applicable. This has to mean more than just some debate between two old guys uh, that, you know, <laughs> we're all having at the dinner table or, you know, the lunch table in the atrium, you know? So yeah. like, um, I think for me, it was actually really, and, and like I said, it took me about eight years because I ended up, uh, I could, financially, I needed to go back to work. I ended up working um, in the youth development sector, you know, again, with, with, with Rangatahi kind of going through really hard stuff. And I, I almost feel like that was the best for me because I was doing my theological reflection, doing those studies, yet at the same time being forced to wrestle with the reality of that and the implications. And so um, it kind of really brought my studies and my theology down into the dirt, you know, into, mm. into the gutter, as I say, you know, where mm. I believe Christ is. So yeah, well, I lo it was, I love, it was really I, lo pivotal. I love the tandem of that. Cause it's like, you know, often it is just theoretical, right. But it's like mm. it, your, your context demanded orthopraxis, you know, like yeah. your, you really needed to, it needed to actually have kind of an interface. That's like, actually this either works or it doesn't. Right. Mm. Like, I, I guess I'm curious where, where there are a number of moments and uh, that it what did feel like this is challenging on the faith side of things, given what I'm seeing. Mm. Was that, was that kind of uh, tough to see that dichotomy? And challenging to, to be honest, like the more I studied the scriptures, the more I feel like I'd always been on that journey, you know, around mm. like who I believe God to be. And the more I dug into that, like the more it became clearer. Um, mm. And so I, I didn't, uh, there wasn't a challenge of faith around me questioning my faith at that point. Um, it was just more a, a deepening of that, you know, mm. gi giving me language that that helped me kind of sit in those really uncomfortable spaces in, in a far more powerful and and in healthy way, I believe. Um, did Did you yeah. ever have the moment? I mean, there are a lot of um. So I I worked a lot with first year lay law students when mm. I was doing my masters and stuff. Um if we talk about the first year break uh first year shakes you second year breaks you third year remakes you right with your mm. with your degree yeah um and it was a lot of uh end of first year beginning of second year a lot of people drop out because mm. the theoretical and the praxis do not mesh well sometimes mm. because studying theology is a very insulated way to study scripture um, and yeah. it can be really, really difficult for some people. Did you ever just want to throw up your hands and walk out and just go, mm. this isn't fitting with what I'm doing. I don't like it. I'm out. Like, yeah, no, no not really. Like I think, um, yeah. And I'd, I'd heard all that coming in. Um, mm. I think one of the differences I, I feel like I, I've probably been studying theology my whole life. You know, I, I, I know some students turn up and they haven't read through the whole Bible yes. before they haven't, mm. you know, or they haven't, they, they find something they've never seen. Like I, well, my Since husband was only a Christian for a year when he turned up yeah, and started yeah. studying theology. So, he didn't know any of the stories. <laughs> so like from a kid, like I read through the Bible like daily, right? And from the beginning to the end, like that was kind of the tradition. Um, I would be often engaging, reading books, you know, listening to podcasts, not podcasts back then, radio, you know, yeah, listening radio. to the radio, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know, that sort of thing, uh, you know, sermons, um, things outside of even my immediate sort of tradition that I was growing up in. So, mm. you know, I was... Um, I was always pretty interested in theology and it kind of just exposed yeah. me to a, I guess something that, you know, more options around what felt yeah. more congruent with what I was picking up from the scriptures. Cause I was looking around yeah. me at all these, you know, theological sources I was looking at and felt like, Oh, maybe these don't necessarily fit. Well, they're not answering the questions I have. So it, it was actually just really enriching um, to have yeah. a space where I was able to really dig deeper and, mm. and start to, you know, understand my faith a, a lot more yeah. um, or understand my experiences I was having with God yeah. a lot more. See, I find that really challenging. Is uh, so I'm a, a new mum, and like, mm. it, it, 
I've been thinking with my son, he's seven months old. I'm thinking, you know, how do you raise them to not have a crisis of faith when they're older because their their world is so in, like small in terms of what mm. they've been taught in their faith. And I have to say, like, kudos to your your mum for like or your parents to for giving you that that wideness of mm. of learning that yeah. wasn't necessarily in your tradition. It was like lots of different people. Like that's awesome that you didn't then turn up at later on and find that kind of scary that there were so many views out there. Yeah. And it, and it might be like, uh, we were homeschooled, um, a real like mum's a reader. It was, it was very much mm. part of kind of our culture, our family culture, I guess. Yeah. Um, which is and awesome. So I, yeah. I feel like it held us in good stead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's huge. Like, mm. yeah, kudos to your mum. She sounds like yeah, a, um, an amazing woman. Yeah. She's, she's <laughs> yeah. pretty special. If my son talks about me the way you talk about your mum one day, <laughs> I will die a happy woman. So. <laughs> okay. okay, so going so going on from sorry. my... Oh, sorry. Yeah, Don't you want to jump in? I, I just, I, yeah, just... So when you were, when you were reading the scriptures as a, as a child, was this in a in a family group that somebody was unpacking or were you just reading scriptures yourself and interpreting the the stories in scripture in in light of your own life and your own own experience does that make sense yeah yeah i mean we had kind of like a tradition of both right um it was a big it, it was regular that we would read scriptures together, you know, that we'd have conversations together about our faith, about the scriptures. And then, you know, we were encouraged and, you know, I definitely was um, fairly devout and having kind of a regular devotional time where I read the scriptures by myself and journaled and thought things through. And um, yeah, it was pretty an active conversation in our family. Yeah. So that's, that is in itself quite astounding for someone like, I'm just saying, like, I don't know many people. I don't. How old are you? Can I ask that? How old are you, AJ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirty. 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 Right. Okay. So yeah. I don't know many people, kind of like in a, in our age group. Well, I mean, I'm nearly forty, but you know, like, I'll say, I'll say, <laughs> I don't know many people. <laughs> age thirty. No, no, no. My husband is thirty-one. I always claim his age is my age group. Okay. So I um... might as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got to, right? got yeah. to. You got to, to not feel yeah. too old. Anyway, yeah. but it's it's very rare to find people who will just sit and read the Bible as a kid mm. and journal. You know, like mm. I I I don't know. Like I mean, I would read the Bible and journal, and then I would forget about it after about two weeks, and then you know, it would be six months later that I'd go, oh, maybe I should do that again as a kid. You know, like. But it was a very legalistic thing in my family as well. It was yeah. like you should and you have to and you, you know. Mm. Um, and so it was almost like a rebellious thing to not do it. Mm. Um, that's just such yeah. an, like an incredible thing for a young person I, to want to do. Yeah, I think it's one of those, those other sides around sort of that Pentecostal tradition as well. Like God in that space for us is very, was very alive, very real. And so there was a real... Um, you know, at least for me, like a real hunger to understand that and to know that and to and to learn more. And um yeah. yeah. It, it is, it is... To, to... sorry, yeah. I was just gonna say it is curious because like in my role where I'm like, you know, exposed to a lot of like uh students from different faith traditions, mm. it is interesting that there is I can say that pretty candidly, like there's a dearth of biblical literacy, you know, with mm. our students, you know, yeah. like mm. far less, right? And it is mm. interesting that the emphasis in charismatic and Pentecostal circles is it is in the experience that God is mm. found, which mm. don't get me wrong, not to ever devalue that, not to ever, but it's like mm. only this. And you, you, you have like, you were blessed with this context of like this, but also the scripture is the mm. means yeah. by which we encounter and experience mm. God. Like that's actually really unique i think um that's what i'm appreciating yeah. as christine and yeah. tonya as well mm. yeah 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 so i uh, i think oh I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around what i'm actually thinking here <laughs> apologies but <laughs> when when you was in that sort of the bigger bigger church and your family's going along to that are you seeing Christ in people and and Christ working and moving in people? Because from what you said earlier, it, you were seeing Christ, I'm presuming, in you and in the other when you was on the fringes of society. Mm. Does that make sense? So 
I'm presuming that you left that big, the the, the bigger church. Yeah. Um, so, so what was that? What was going on there for you? In in what was Christ doing? What was that journey? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I I think I see Christ and all people moving and, and working. Um, you know, always even even in the most complex um, and sometimes you know, less than healthy environments. You know, I think we still see these glimmers of grace and love um, kind of emerging through those spaces. Um, I, I guess, you know, as I was getting to know, you know, Christ more, you know, and, and through my own understanding of, of the scriptures and, you know, my own experience and, and also what I was seeing with the young people I was serving, like I really was feeling and seeing God in those um, in those who were suffering. And I was also seeing God turn up in those moments of of grief and loss and hardship. Um, not necessarily to fix things, um, but to be there. Um, you know, th those moments sitting with young men, I remember, um, and, and this was kind of all kind of happening at the same time, you know, kind of going to laid law, making decisions around leaving sort of the church I was at and, you know, serving these young people. And I remember sitting with, you know, a young man, like as he's like wrestling with ending his life, you know, and, and, and being there with him in that moment, you know, and thinking, man, like God's here with us in this, you know, Christ in me, Christ in him you know christ mm. around us um yeah so what what motivated you to then leave that church like what was it about it that that just yeah wasn't... I, yeah i think i think there's a range of things um i think the 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 theology taught did not feel authentic to the world and the experience of even those who were attending, you know, I shared a little bit of my own experience of, you know, going through really hard stuff as a family and coming and, you know, having this triumphant sort of theology around, you know, it's going to be okay. And, you know, just pray and give and do these things and that, you know, and, and God will be there. Whereas it's just so often not the reality, you know? Um, so it just didn't feel like there was, it was an authenticity, to, to that mm. faith and I you know I never say look that people aren't sincere I definitely think that people in those contexts are, are incredibly sincere and and doing what they can within the theological constraints that they have and the worldviews that they have um but when I looked at what was happening in the world around me I didn't see a consistency um I also didn't see a consistency in the scriptures with you know I think some of the priorities that we see in the gospels um that Jesus has for the poor and the marginalized and for this world not just the world after um, I didn't see that consistency there either. And so, you know, I guess there was a grating between, you know, kind of, you know, the mood, the feeling, the theology, the faith, and the, the lived reality of this community and and kind of what I was experiencing and, and reading and understanding in the scriptures as well. Mm. Cool. Mm. Can I ask you just as you got there, what were the what were the one or two papers at Laidlaw that really formed this, cemented this? Oh, Hmm. I, I don't I don't I don't know if there were, there was one or two like I feel like this was just like a, a constant conversation I mean I do remember very early days uh oh I can't even remember maybe it was theology 101 uh, I can't remember Mark McConnell the first oh, <laughs> first <gosh>. year um, <laughs> way back Sorry. but 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 the debate was all around like suffering you know is God good is yeah. God great you like all that yeah. sort of stuff I, I remember that <clears throat> moment being being one where um, I think, as I said, like all my uh, peers were having these like really high in the clouds debates, which, you know, are great. I mean, I love debating theology. It, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, I love the arguments and the intricacy. But Don't tell us know, that. We will so go down rabbit holes. The wrong crowd to say that too. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing these, these, these huge conversations, right, happening. And I'm like, how does that make any sense to this kid? You know, yeah. how does that make any sense to the young man who want, who's sitting in front of me that wants to end his life, you know, to this kid who's, who's, who's sleeping on his, you know, auntie's couch and there's, there's 10 of them in this home, which is poor and damp and, you know, they're suffering and to, to all these boys that I'm working with and none of them have their dads and their, and their families and they're all, you know, they're all going through some really, really hard stuff and I'm like, it's got to be more than an intellectual exercise, you know, it's got to be more than just, you know, um, 
you know, thoughts in our heads. Like if the gospel is true, it's got to be real and it's got to have real life implications. You know, surely God didn't just come so we could de debate theology um, as fun as that could be, you know, like yeah. there's, yeah. there's, there's got to be more to that. And there has to be some form of answer to the suffering that I'm seeing in front of me. You know, there has so to be something sounds, in this. Yeah, that's, that, that sounds like Mark McConnell and David Williams type, <laughs> yeah. type papers. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, suffering and hope. I'd imagine. Yeah, suffering and hope. I was thinking. <laughs> I never that. got. I, like, I actually never got to suffering and hope. Uh, really? Oh, really? Oh, wow! Oh, mate. You sound like you could write the paper. Legendary <laughs> paper. That was. That, <laughs> I thought it was going to break Laidlaw that paper. Oh, <laughs> That's I what I heard. Yeah. It yeah. Was mental. <laughs> it was crazy. Absolutely mental yeah. paper. I think a anyway. lot. It, it really did make a lot of people who hadn't necessarily ever come across that kind of level of suffering before mm. like it it was really shocking to them that paper to to have to sit yeah. and answer those questions whereas um I mean I don't know if you if listen to any of our podcasts or anything but mm. Tony and I definitely and and Jared as well um have all faced levels of suffering in our life and mm. had to answer those questions and so I think each of us probably didn't find that paper quite as breaking as some people did. Yeah. Um, some people definitely, they they struggled. They struggled. Yeah. I remember some very heated conversations around that one. That was a, it was an interesting one. Yeah. Um, and I guess a, a, an interesting thing, I think, coming into Laidlaw for me was I had this strong conviction that God was love, right? And, mm. and that God is love. Yeah. Um, and so even though I didn't often have the, always have the theology figured out, you know, I was able to take on new ideas, you know, once I sort of found ways to understand that better. Because sometimes my theology was quite traditional in, in spaces where it didn't actually fit, you know, um, mm, but as I mm. developed. So I didn't have that jarring sense because I, I guess mm. I had this, this, I had this something, I had something to stand on, you know, even out yeah. as I was deconstructing and, and, you know, unpacking. And I don't even know if deconstructing yeah. was the word I would use, you know, I guess mm. uh, I don't know if I have a better one, but, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I used it's a to bit call of a different it... one than I think others uh, others have often described. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I used to call it um, when I was going through Laidlaw um, the cornerstone of my faith, and it mm. was it was for me was Jesus' death and resurrection. Everything else mm. was up for debate, but that was yeah. that was my cornerstone. And so everything <laughs> like and and I have I have different. I, I would say I, I have different solidified things now, but when I was going in, it was, that was it. And it was small enough that I could stand on it and everything else was, was okay. You to, to mm. argue You're about. You're a lucky and, girl. You're why? Lucky girl. Jesus done a Sparta kick on my theology and man, it was, it was like this beautiful, it was like this beautiful edifice made out of all of these blocks i could understand everything and then he's just like, <laughs> bosh there you go son. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my days what are you playing at <laughs> yeah. i'm so glad i didn't have to go through that one <laughs> yeah um, i went right for it I went now, tony, and I went how long was how long was the free fall tony how long was the free fall <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's still going mate it's still going <laughs> i went to see i went to see mark Kewen. Got to Mark Hewan and I said, look, I've had enough. End of the second year. Uh, I'm done. Oh, you and... were one of the second year students. I should have been talking to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. End of the second year. <laughs> oh, my gosh. A proper spot kick. And, uh, and he said, go away and write your testimony. Uh, write your testimony down and see where God's been in the journey. Mm. And so that was, we finished college in no November. Um, back in the February... I think I wrote 40,000 words over that summer holiday on my testimony and mm. come back and A plus the third mm. year. Nice. Wow. Nice. Uh, I actually forget Mark Hewan, that his his papers were pretty impactful for uh, me as well. Um, Gospel of Luke specifically, I think yeah. one of my yes, a couple of my yes. essays there really had uh, a huge impact on my theology. Still do. Yeah. Um, Hewan is amazing. Romans. I done Romans with Mark. That was a fight. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you and Kieran would have just fought the whole way through. Anyway, oh, no, 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 it's not about you, Tony. We're talking about uh -oh. AJ. But... <laughs> um, okay, so AJ, going on from Laidlaw, I mean, like we would all sit there and reminisce for days, but yeah. um, moving on from there, um, obviously, like you have done a lot of 
political stuff now. So you've engaged with the Oranga Tamariki Oversight Bill, the Chloe Swarbrick's Alcohol Reform Bill, the Critique on Tough on Crime Rhetoric, the Ending Youth Homelessness Campaign, um, about local elections and support for Ifisa Collins, uh, relevant New Zealand church culture commentary. Like you've you've had a lot of stuff going on. Mm. Um, and, you know, like a lot of it is about social justice and community engagement. And obviously mm. that is where your passion and your heart is, is for, like you said, Jesus in the gutters. Um, people who, who are really struggling. And um, I mean, it's, it's really cool to hear how, you know, it wasn't just your life, but your theology that really formed that for you. Mm. Um, so moving on from Laidlaw, do you feel that, um, I mean, I, I, I'll leave the two boys to ask whatever questions they want, but for me, it's it's really like, do you feel that your theology is still growing and changing? Um, are you still engaging with a lot of the research? Like a lot of people, they leave Laidlaw and you can tell the year that they leave Laidlaw because the theological books on their shelf stop at that date. You know, like they haven't bought anything new since they left Laidlaw. Um, do you do you still engage with that? Is it still forming? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I'd say um, I, I used to say that it was actually after Laidlaw when I felt like my real studies began. You know, like, yeah. um, and, and that was when I really started to be able to, I guess you know, direct my own study and, and kind of dig into ideas and thoughts that I, you know, was, was getting more interested in at different points in time. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I haven't stopped engaging uh, theologically and reading and um, learning and it's, it's, I guess, a part of, yeah. Cause it is, it is growth. interesting. I mean, yeah. like I, I love a lot of your stuff that you put up. I also mm. disagree with a lot of your stuff that you put up, um, which <laughs> there's, I'm, a long I'm, line. there's a long yeah, line there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable sitting in that gray space mm. with people. Like I'm like, okay, like mm. it's, it's good that there are people in the church that we agree with and disagree with. Like that's mm. just humanity, yeah. right? That's yeah, fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. However, like, I do find it really interesting because Laidlaw mm. is fairly conservative in mm -hmm. its theological yeah. views, right? You are not, in, in a lot of places, very conservative. <laughs> and, yeah. and I love it because it's challenging and it challenges mm. me. Like, when you put stuff up that I don't agree with, it makes me stop and go, okay, why don't I agree with this? And it makes mm -hmm. me push really hard into what I think and what I believe mm. um, and and really unpack it before yeah. I just write you off completely because yeah. that's that's not helpful to anybody, right? Yeah. Um so Respect. how did you yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, it's it's difficult. It's a real it's a real trait <laughs> in today's world. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, I I'll just like be be working through some stuff if I'm not commenting because I'm like I'm yeah. not just gonna jump on and say I don't agree with you. It's like why don't I agree with yeah. <laughs> love it. I love it. Um, can, can, I, but, can I can I can I jump in on that like Christine and please like yeah. continue to clarify that point like i i think it's like it almost comes across in how he posts as well like that's something that i've seen you really value aj is just like finding the nuance where is christ <laughs> in both sides of the spectrum like you know how do we actually jesus is clearly here and jesus is clearly here mm. but like there are some areas that he clearly isn't like Mm. I think you're really good at actually doing that. I found yeah, that, living in you know? the gray. You're li yeah. good at living in the gray. And and I love mm. that because I live a lot in the gray and in, in the stuff that I do as well. Mm. And and I think it's a really important place to sit. And I think Jesus lived a lot in the gray as well, which pissed yeah. people off. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just really interested in how you got from conservative laid law to mm. some of your viewpoints now. Like, is that that from just from your own experiences that the and taking the theology and and applying it or is it an ongoing like you said you your theology like you kind of said your theology really started after you finished laid law is that from mm. reading um theologians around social justice or is that just from you taking what you know and applying it that kind of thing yeah i mean uh, i I don't, I don't view my journey as like it happened here, sort of like a light bulb moment right. thing. Yeah. Like I, I think even, even as a kid, I feel like this was the direction I was always walking, you know, and I just, right. I, I developed more language and, you know, like I said, I, I started from the space in my theology where I believe that God is love 
you know it's mm. okay well, what does that mean in the world what does mm. it mean to actually you know and if god is love and and god is f- fully represented and you know you look at in jesus christ and jesus christ crucified you know mm. and, and we look at that image of god mm. and that's the purest image of god um then how, what does that mean in the way that i should live and in the world mm. around us and the communities we should build and mm-hmm. um and what god wants and dreams for this world and so so uh, that was kind of already where I was, even in a conservative context. I just had mm. some theology that maybe didn't really align with what I felt or experienced. Mm. And so the more I went down that track, it's just continued. I guess it's just been a journey where I feel like I, I don't feel like there's been a turnaround moment. It's just been um, a continued thing. increasing. Mm. And yeah, over the years, I found other theologians that, you know, maybe have language for some of the things that I've been thinking about, but it really mm. started in the Gospels. And like I said, actually, in, in um, it, reading the gospels for myself um at laid law studying with, with mark kewen you know getting into the gospel of luke like i think there were some really like key moments sort of studying that text um that had a huge impact on me um and then just continuing to to do my theological study as i got involved in the realities of this world um and mm. i think those two things kind of just continued to to take me down that track so when it comes to because i know you you have some fairly strong views around um, you know, just pol- the political landscape of New Zealand, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, how do you walk the line with other Christians who may completely disagree with your political mm. views? Um, mm. when when for you it is such a, it's come for you from the study of the Bible and the study of theology and all that kind of thing, and it's so mm. integral to p- your faith. Yeah. How do how do you navigate that well when you come across people who are like, no, I don't think the Bible says that at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, one of the things I really, you know, hold to is you know, and I talk a lot about sort of, um, you know, love is the way is kind of like a phrase that I uh, it used to govern me, and it's, um, it's it's all about how we we live, walk, and and operate in this world, right? Um, mm. That the way of love is the way of you know self sacrifice. It's the way of you know, forgiveness, it's the way of grace, it's the way, um, you know, of radical, radical um, care and compassion and justice, you know, it's all those things. Um, I believe that when we walk the way of love, we can't be really against any person, you know, we may be against systems and structures, um, and, and we may need to name those very clearly, that those systems and structures are causing harm, and that behaviors are causing harm, um, that attitudes and theologies and ideologies may cause harm, but human beings are all made in the divine image, you know, we all hold that image. Um, so when I come against people, you know, come to people in my world, and that, you know, that they, they disagree with me, or, you know, even vehemently so, or even involved in sort of uh, ways of being that I find to be quite harmful to others um i can see christ in them still Um, and and you know one of the things that i believe as well is that actually you know sometimes some of the you know maybe um some of the worldviews and ways of being that we have that cause harm to others are also causing harm to ourselves. And so there's a work there to, to liberate those who are in bondage to those, uh, you know, whether they be theologies or, or worldviews or politics or, you know, mm-hmm. modes of working in the world, you know? And so mm-hmm. I don't see my work as just um, liberating those who are deemed depressed, but actually all of us um, in some way have been captured by, you know, something which is causing us harm. And so how do we, how do we extend love across that divide? um to, to create change in this world absolutely yeah. i don't know if that answers yeah. your question yeah no no it does i mean mm. and, and on the back of that i mean do you think with um uh, the wider church in new zealand do you th- do you feel that we as a church are engaging meaningfully with politics why or mm. why not do you think we need to be doing more do you think yeah, you know like the- that's an interesting question. I, I think there is, um, I, I often, uh, I struggle to find language sometimes because you, you you know, everyone's got different ways of talking about things. And I, the, the, the way I often think, I think there's a kind of like a dominant church culture. And I think that kind of dominant voice, the, often the louder, the stronger voice within church, uh, maybe not really engaging in politics. I mean, 
there is a political voice, but it is often that I can think of what I described before, you know, far more sort of individualistic focus, or if it is political, it's, it's much more around the sort of strict moral concerns that maybe exist within some forms of our, uh, our yeah. tradition. Um, and then there's, there's voices on the fringes, but they often don't maybe have the the reach that others have to kind of see that they exist, um, that are calling, I think, the church to a different way of being and living. Um, I guess, you know, f- f- should we do more? Uh, I guess, again, that comes down to the way that you define the church and, and faith. And, and for me, I see the church as being far more than what we do on a Sunday morning. Um or even, you know, about it's far more than us having a relationship. I believe that um, the church is called to be an alternative community in the heart of the empire. You know, we're to be this community mm. that lives in a different way, fundamentally different to the culture and the society we have around us. And that's not just about, you know, morality. That's about how we care for each other and for our planet. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, when we look at it that way, you know, that actually our faith is, is this faith, which is embodied and it, it has a real implication here on earth and how we, how we structure our community and, and how we care and, and love for others. Then, you know, I do think we have a role in, in the wider political space. Um, I, I talk a lot about the divine dream, you know, so, you know, like God's dream for this world. And I think we're called to dream with God about what this world could look like or what this world should look like if if not for the sin and decay and corruption that's here. And, and, and that has implications, you know, for me, you know, I don't believe that in the divine's dream for this world, that we would have a world full of inequality and poverty and homelessness that actually, if, you know, the child who streets on the sleep tonight is God's child, then what is our responsibility to that young person? You know, um, I think those are some real important questions for us to ra- grapple with as a church. Yes, it's interesting because, because, like, I mean, I grapple with those questions and things. I mean, me personally, and it leads me further away from politics to create a community mm. within the empire rather than mm. into politics because yeah, and- the political system. I'm like everyone I vote for has something I have a huge issue with if they then do that, you know, and, and I can't in good faith feel like I can vote for anybody at this point. So let's do something completely alternative within the culture that we've got. Yeah. And I, and and I, I think there's, there's, there's both elements, right? Um, Yeah. I think we have a power system, which we can use levers to Mm. um, bring about a measure of justice in the world, Mm. but I don't think our salvation is in governments. You know, I I think Mm. there's definitely some things that we can do, we can achieve, um, by engaging in the systems that we have. Um, but also there's a real role for us to be creating communities, you know, and, and, and those two things, I think sometimes we have to do, you know, I, I kind of work across those different spheres. I'm also part of like an intentional community, um, where we're kind of existing to, you know, myself, my wife and kids, and we've got another couple, um, of my good friends, Josh, uh, Josh and Trinette Taylor, I mean, they're, they're kids as well, and, and we kind of exist to, to serve young people as well. So young people who are experiencing homelessness to come and stay with us for a short period of time rather than going into a hotel or sleeping on the street, right? Mm. Um, and it's a whole journey in itself. But but that's kind of that that more micro level of like developing the community that can live a mm. different way, that can mm. maybe experience or, or live what it means to be the church, you mm. know, Monday to Monday to Sunday, 9 to 5, not 9 to 5, 24 7, you know, like that yeah, reality, yeah. right? Um, but I think there's a responsibility or an ability for both um, because there's some things we can start doing. We can start building that community in the, in, in the husk of the old, you know, uh, that mm. new thing. Um, and yet there is a reality that there are powers that be in this nation that um, are causing untold harm. And um, we have a way to to make some change for people in that space. Mm. Do you, I, I, do you, can I, oh, sorry, can I ask yeah, go it? Jared. Sorry, I've been asking yeah. heaps. Yeah. No, it's all good. I like, I'm, because I'd, I'd love for, to also provide like a further kind of teasing out of that, if you don't mind, AJ. Mm. Yeah, go um, for it. So just a analogy that's kind of comparative, like I work in the Christian schooling space, right? Mm. Um, and so being in that space, I am very aware pretty frequently that like um, Christian schools are not the church, right? Mm. So it's like kind of, you think about that kind of Venn diagram overlap. I, I'm curious, mm. I guess, like, what your understanding of like you know um what is the intersect of say you know faith 
and say politics or faith and community engagement and where are those points of distinction like where are the kind of like the christian occupies both those spaces right but mm-hmm. like you know is there a divide is there like kind of like hey this actually needs to be in those spaces is it wrong to think of it in terms of like this dichotomy like i'd mm-hmm. just be curious to like actually think like what is your understanding there yeah um i guess i don't think in the way that i think um i, th- I think of the church quite holistically that mm. um I-, I don't you know obviously we have our institutional churches um but i but i think there is an invitation into far more authentic community and living in in deep community um and, and in a way where you know like yeah gatherings and all that stuff is is part of our life but but the real life is what does it mean for us to be a community that that lives authentically with our, with each other um sort of daily and i think there's some real power in that and and in that space those lines are just not as clearly drawn you know um being a part of the church being a part of this community of faith is an everyday occurrence which involves mm. um you know cleaning up the dishes and you know vacuuming the floor and um you know being forgiven because i forgot to clean up the dishes again and it was my turn and you know all of that stuff over and over and over again um you know caring for for people who sometimes don't care for you but forgiving them anyway having a having an argument and then turning up and having breakfast together the next day like this is just all um part of like living church is more than just a sunday morning service and kind of the way that i think of it um yeah i don't know if that answers your question but yeah Yeah, i would have said jared i would have said working in a christian school is the church like i i don't see I was going to disagree with your separation there, but Ooh, anyway. Yeah, no, it's like. Because I would say I, working like, you know, Luke, my husband's a social worker. I would say mm. what he does is church. like. But the part of our vocation, <laughs> the part of our vocational theology that we have to be careful to work out is I am engaging with students who their only experience of church is the Christian school. So we need to be careful to actually delineate and actually say, actually, you know, if this is your experience of church, it's like not to say that that isn't wholesome and isn't, that isn't good. Like, when you know, actually, we're not going to do everything we can as teachers to actually disciple, grow that. But it's also like that awareness of like, actually, there are things that the church does that only the church can do. Like, if right, that makes yeah. sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I, yeah. I, I feel like, you know, Forgive me, it might be my own theological package, AJ, because I'm, you know, projecting my experience <laughs> yeah, onto good. yours. You know, but I, mm. I was just with, with. I like the idea of like it is more holistic, and it is the idea mm. of like you are the Christ disciple wherever you are. You carry the name of God, whatever context you're in. Mm. So therefore, it's about serving God where that applies. Yeah, and and I think again, often when we start to talk about like faith and the stuff that individuals do, we think very individualistically right yes, i don't think yeah. my no, myself in those spaces and the church um mm. i am part of a community of faith mm. Mm. And, and this mm. is part of the role that i play within my community mm. um and you know we we work together um you know a, a lot of what i do i can't do by myself you know um you know we work together to to see god's kingdom come today on earth as it is in heaven you know mm. um yeah <clears throat> I mean, just think about, so, so you think about sort of the political engagement stuff that I do, like I can't do any of that without Summer, you know, um, she's amazing. She keeps me alive half the time, um, <laughs> you know, uh, even if it's just making sure that I eat, um, but we're a team, you know, and, and I, and we couldn't be a really good team without the community, you know, Josh and Jeanette, who we live with, who support and oh. care for us, you know, when we're oh. weak and in, in, in the same the other way around. And so, you know, um, yeah, beautiful. one of the things that I, sh- I, I struggle with, I think, with our individualistic way of thinking about faith is you'll get people that come into ch- to a Sunday morning, a gathering, right, a service, and they'll talk about justice, right? But they'll put the pressure on the individual to say, you go and do, right? And, th- and that's not what I'm saying. I think we as a communities of faith need to think about how do we structure our communities to enable us to live in a way that is a real alternative not so you jared can go off and you know go love all the poor by yourself and and change the world it's not about you it's about us as a community so are our communities reflecting uh 
uh, the, the image of God are our communities, spaces where we can start to dream of God around what it means to be a part of this, you know, dreaming this divine dream where we can see mm. his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Um, because it has to be a collective thing. It can't mm. be just you uh, or me out there by myself. I know that, you know, you you have been uh, quite vocal in some of the stuff supporting, particularly some of the left, more left politics. Um mm. Do you think there's a danger in um, putting a, a name of, of uh, what's the word I'm looking for, melding together a, a Christian and a certain set of political viewpoints and kind of representing um, to the world as mm. this is the political view of my faith? Does it does it make sense? Mm. Like, do you, uh, and then people kind of wondering, um, well, so in order to be a Christian, does AJ therefore think I need to be a lefty? You know, like that kind of thing. Mm. Is, I yeah. mean, I and I'm sure you get this pushback from people as well, um, you know, because I think any Christian in any kind of political sphere gets torn apart by the other side. Like that just happens. Yeah. Is there a danger in that? Do you? How do you navigate that? Uh, Jared, sorry, you got your hand sorry. up. Sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I'm... I think it's interesting on the back of actually doing the interview with James Andrew Harris, right? Like, mm. I wonder if what you are articulating and what you have articulated so far, AJ, is that you're actually agreeing with Christine and what she's saying and posing the question, but that it's actually the Christian right that has a lot for it to answer in terms of actually misrepresenting what the gospel is about. Would that be fair to say there? I... um. I, I dislike the left, right, progressive, conservative mm. categories, if I'm honest. Mm. I, yes, I, I, don't. I, do, I, don't, I don't find them helpful. Yeah. And, yeah. Forget, and I think they create, forgive us that we create, go to those. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, it's, it's all right. I mean, we kind of we kind of inducted it into it in our culture today. Yes. It's, it's, yes. You know, you have to define yourself. I, I don't use those labels for myself. Mm. Mm. Um, in, in terms of my faith, I, I do think the scriptures um, say some clear things around the way that we should care for others. Um, and how we should care for those around us. Um, you know, some of those things align maybe closer to some political leanings. Am I saying that if you don't have um, those political leanings or my understanding of faith that, look, you're not a Christian or, you know, you're a horrible person? No, because, you know, as I think I talked about before in terms of um, the way of love, I still believe there's an invitation for others. And I believe that there's also, you know, a lot of grace that actually God understands where we are on our journey, meets us where we are and helps us take whatever next step that is. And so are we moving towards Christ? Are we moving away? That's, I think, the question that's at play. Um, I'm very connected to, you know, it's, even in my my own family, people who are very deeply conservative and vehemently disagree with me. Do I think that they're apostate, you know, and that they're going to go and burn in hell? No. <laughs> uh, I see, I see even in some Do they of the think most, you are? <laughs> probably, yes, actually. Many, many, t- many tell me uh, that, that I've, I've gone too far they can smell the flames burning already um, no we'll rebuke that in jesus name we'll rebuke it but if you, <laughs> I, I think it's at that orientation right you know where yeah. are you walking towards um I, you know i i do think there are things that have been said you know i do think that hey look this is when, when i read the scriptures i interpret it this way i think there are some conclusions there right um However, I am not going to um, cast someone aside because we have a political difference, right? I'd be much rather be willing to engage in relationship and conversation and hopefully, you know, we'd maybe move forward together in, in some areas. Um, but if we continue to disagree, then then that's okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if that Which answers Which is a hard thing in question. today's world. No, it does. It, is, it, it, does. it is hard because yeah. people want us to be left or right. They want us to be yeah. uh, black, black or white. You know, I, I, I'm also very, I, I, I'm also very critical of of the left, you know, and and the right as well as the right in different ways. And I have publicly criticised those who. Um, different aspects of leftist, progressive social justice culture as well. Um, I think the world wants us into nice little box boxes, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. it's harder when you're kind of trying to navigate this gray space. I think 
actually God exists in the grays and actually the world is a thousand shades of gray, you know, um, and kind of leaning into that reality. And I think some of that is based in, in my work with, with young people um, who live in really complex situations and actually black and white doesn't work. Black and white, it, it can be really oppressive and harmful. Um, it often doesn't really understand the lived experience of what people are going through. Um, so I think God has far more grace uh, than we give uh, them credit for. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I have one last question from my my thoughts so far. As you move forward, what do you see in your ministry as the kingdom come? What does it look like for you mm. going forward? What does the kingdom come? Um yeah, I mean uh, sorry. Just, just yeah. nice, just a nice, small simple question. Yeah, a simple question. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to do, you know, I think the reality of kingdom come on earth is uh, is that tension of now, but not yet. Uh, you know, will we will we see that come in my lifetime? Likely not. Um, but I guess what I can say is I believe that um, God, the divine, is inviting us into a new way of living, you know, into a reconnection um, with one another and, and the environment and the world around us. Um, you know, I, I often think that that we have an opportunity, you know, we, we, we're living in a, in a time where, you know, I guess hyper-individualism, consumerism, it, it's kind of been shown for what it is. You know, we're seeing the pain and the suffering in our societies, in our communities, our mental health, poverty, inequality, uh, what's happening to environment. Um, the way that we're living as human beings is not working out for us very well, especially here in the West. And there's an opportunity um, for the church to really recognize that and step into a new way of being, to start to live as an alternative community and, and how we structure our communities and how we care for one another and how we create communities of care that can care for others. Um, and I think that's part of participating in, in this new kingdom that, that God is building. Um, that's part of dreaming with the divine, um, you know, living as if it was really possible to end poverty, as if it was really possible to end homelessness, as if it was really possible to actually care for one another to care for our planet i think those things are possible um and i think it's the church's job to be audacious enough to to live in such a way uh that that could become reality if we joined with with each other and did that mm. Mm. Good. I like that. thank you that's beautiful love that yeah it's a good answer to a mm. massive question tony <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question it was a good question no, fantastic answer I, I appreciated it mm. yeah um, I'd love to ask you some questions there, friend, on, mm. uh, so two really, one's a bit cheeky because I want to ninja in some nuance to it and like, you know, it's got some parts to it. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love it. Well, so the first is just kind of deferring to the fact that like, uh, looking at some of the breadth of your work, you know, I'm thinking, uh, your work with, uh, the Massey community board, I'm thinking like, uh. Uh, Manaki Nangatahi, I'm thinking the Safety Net Project. There's obviously an expertise and a knowledge you've developed around the issue of youth homelessness in New Zealand. I've seen a lot of your posts yeah. speak on this as well. Yeah. So, uh, so I'd love is actually like for our church, for two or three gathered listeners, just for like uh, Christians in general, like just actually to define that issue a little bit more. So like the first part is really asking, what would you say is the scale, the urgency and the dynamics of that issue as you see it in New Zealand? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a huge, huge thing in, in your right. I'd spend a lot of my time uh, daily thinking around and working towards solving and ending um, youth homelessness in Aotearoa. Um, and one of the reasons is that that is where it's kind of a litany of failures within our society that leads a young person into that experience. And if we can uh, kind of plug up those gaps, it's going to serve so many more uh, within our society. So, you know, I don't tell you experience homelessness are some of our most marginalized in our whole society. Um, yeah. I, I mean, over, over 50% or near 50% of those who experience homelessness in Aotearoa um, are young people uh, between the age of 16 and 25. Wow. 
Um, yet despite that, you know, there's no really structured strategy to address an end and there's far more support for you as an adult. If you've experienced homelessness today, than there would be if you're 16, um, there's just not the options out there. Uh, a new service as an example that's opening up in the city, uh, on Monday, uh, which we're very excited about. Um, they've got 16 beds. Uh, they received 130 applications with a barely advertising, you know, young people that were in desperate need, wow. um, so, so it, it is a huge issue, but we still don't really have uh, the data that we need to 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 understand it properly. And that's because there just hasn't been visibility. There hasn't been um, the research gone into it. But we can say that actually every service that is working with these young people is turning them away daily. Um, that we've got Rangatei reaching out for support and there's just not housing or support available to them. Years ago, I, I worked um, with youth in, in North Shore and they were with mm-hmm. homeless youth. And it, it was the same thing. And just even trying to get them support from wins or anything because yeah. to go home was unsafe. And mm, yet, yeah. you know, and there was nowhere for them to go. It was it was a nightmare trying to mm. find support for yeah. them. And and that well, was that was 15 years ago. And it's still the same. And, and, to, and to be honest, only recently, we, you know, we're starting to see some improvements. That's really through a lot of the work of Manaki Rangatahi. It's collective that's working together on this issue. It's based mm. up of a whole range of organizations that are all just saying, look, we got to do something about this. Mm. Um, and it's sort of Manaki Rangatahi's advocacy, which has really highlighted this issue and, and start to see some changes. But, you know, it was it was barely a year ago when we had zero to none, you know, actual youth homelessness outreach services in the city, you know, yeah. we've, we've slowly started to get, get a few That's of those. Yeah. Um, back in yeah. 2020, when we said that we ended homelessness and you remember those headlines, you know, <laughs> Aotearoa, New Zealand ends homelessness. Well, you know, I can tell you right now that I know young people that lived on the street during um, those mm. lockdowns initially because mm. they couldn't get into hotels because hotel mm. owners were turning them away because they were too young. Yeah. They couldn't mm. access it. And um, so, you know, it's just huge inequalities um, mm. within the system and our most vulnerable, you know, our young people mm. end up suffering because of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause I, I I'm you, so part of this, the urgency you're saying in the dynamics is there's a visibility issue, right? Cause I think it's mm. like, you get like a attention grabbing headline, and you know justly so like you know a single mum raising kids in her car and everything like Mm. but I guess like you know because you're talking about a dynamic that's affecting a lot of our 16 to 25 right but Mm. are you seeing a lot more of that like it's actually you know some of the youth are involved in ram raids is it younger are they homeless youth are they connected youth Uh, is is it look families like yeah yeah yeah, so we, we hear a lot from our young people that their journeys into experiences of homelessness began when they were kids. You know, some of them slept rough at, you know, I know, I know several right. that slept rough when they were nine or eight right. or seven, right. you know, um, that was like some of their first experiences. You know, there are some some whānau that generationally have been experiencing homelessness, you know, and right. so kids right. grow up in families that are moving couch surfing from place to place. And some right. of the most heartbreaking stories is you hear these stories of young people, and it's it's more than one I've heard, that, that make a choice to say, hey, look, mum dad and baby uh are not going to yeah. find somewhere to stay tonight if if i'm with them because no one yeah. wants a teenager in the house and so they go and and they go through this experience by themselves they go onto the street yeah. um and you know experience all the harm that that happens when a young you know 15 16 year old young woman goes and lives rough you know so um yeah, it's a really complex issue, and there's there's not one reason. Um, there's a whole mm. litany, of, like I said, of failures. We have you know pipelines from our care system to you know our schooling system to our justice system that are leading right into experiences of homelessness. Key mm. places where we could be intervening that we haven't. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's a lot, there's a lot to do um, mm. to really solve this. And, and I guess that part of you know you mentioned the safety net before. Um, so that's a project that I that I'm working on with Massive Community Trust. Um, and part of that is, is about how do we actually empower our community to be part of the solution? Because actually, mm. and we talked before about creating communities of care that can actually live in a different way. And part of that is saying, hey, how can we empower our community to care for those young people in our own community? You know, mm. you've got a spare room. How do we empower you and mm. build community around you so that you can can take that young person on and, and care for them for even a short period of time? Yeah, because mm. a lot of people are scared. Like, and And yeah. I'm very aware of this like um my husband and I have had young people in our homes and things that have needed places to stay and um and and my husband is a social worker and and sees some very uh awful situations and and there is a risk 
and taking mm-hmm. somebody who is very broken um, and from very broken backgrounds, there is a risk of taking them into your home. Um, there is a risk of damage to yourself and to your property. And, you know, and, and people are afraid of it to the point mm-hmm. where it means that nobody gets help. And that yeah. is really sad, particularly in, and I, I find, um, in church settings, if we're more afraid of our of, of damage to our property and to our persons than we are for the potential for this person to be able to be loved and changed, mm-hmm. um, that is really concerning to me. Um, and and yeah. says something I, I, about where our I priorities think, are. And and there is a risk, you know. And and there and is, again, yeah. like I I think love takes risks, and mm-hmm. and I think that's the core of the gospel. You know, come mm-hmm. lay down all that you have and follow me. Um, I remember when, when my wife and I were really like starting to reflect on where we're going to do what we, what we're doing now, you know, living in this way and this, you know, move into intentional community, invite young people into our homes, you know, and people were saying to us, Oh, what about your kids? You know, it's, Mm. it's a risk, you know, all valid concerns and real. Um, and I remember sitting and thinking, man, like if I was like feeling called to go to Africa or to Mm. Asia or wherever, I'd go and I'd take my kids and there'd be a huge risk. And we everyone would be because, behind you though. And everyone, everyone. would be behind you. They'd say, yeah, mm, cool. That's, yeah. that's for the gospel. Mm, mm, but, yeah. but, but I can't take a, a much less risk here. Um, still a risk. Um, you know, we think about that so differently mm, yet, yeah. you know, yeah. Christ is here on our doorstep, sleeping on mm. our streets. You know, we got, mm. we got, you know, Christ sleeping in cars and the gutter, Christ being abused and beaten and calling out for help. And we're shutting our doors, you know? Yeah. And so I think there is, I think there is a divine imperative. I think there is, there's an invitation um, to welcome Christ into our homes through, uh, you know, through the lives of these young people. Um, Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy and it's definitely not going to be simple. It's going to be gray and messy and and mucky and, and hard. And And it's going to change. And you, and you will get hurt, you know, yeah. you will, you know, serving people yeah. who have been hurt is hard and it can, uh, it can cause your own heartache and pain. Mm. Um, but I, is, I just, I, is that not what we're called to do? You know, mm. is that not the invitation that Christ has put before us? Is that not the mm. cross that we've been asked to pick up? It, mm. th- those are the things that I guess I sit with. Um, yeah. especially when, when I, you know, when we talk about, about, you know, Christ talks about sort of the sheep and the goats, you know, and, and that story of, of those who said, look, I, I, you know, Jesus says, Hey, um, you know, when I was in prison, you know, you didn't, you weren't there, you know, when I was suffering or in hospital or hungry, you didn't feed me. You didn't care for me. You didn't do these things to me. Um, I think that's, I, that's, yeah. you know, th- there's some, 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 something there for us to be wrestling with. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. absolutely. absolutely. See, see, cause I'm like, I thank you for, you know, defining some of that issue and some of that scale and some of that mm-hmm. importance i think like something that i want to ask there because you've you've i said three parts you've kind of actually addressed the second but the third i'm kind of actually thinking like in what ways is perhaps you've teased it a little bit but in what ways is the church uniquely placed to actually address the problems associated with youth homelessness like you know maybe it's even a question of actually saying what is it doing and not doing what is it doing that it well, shouldn't and what is it thinking that it's actually mistaken yeah, yeah. look I, I think I, I think one of the very unique things about the church is that we do have um I think all of us have this core theology and, and worldview um that would enable us to serve um in this way you know this this belief of Christ incarnate, you know, this belief that, you know, Christ is in the poor and in those who suffer. Um, and, you know, and in a way, an ability for us to push back against the very individualistic um, kind of dominant culture that we have, that actually it's not just about us, you know, that actually our lives are, are lives that have been called to to serve and to sacrifice for others. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's something we share within the church, regardless of how it's em- emphasized or what language yeah, you use. Good. I think we we kind of really all believe that. Mm. Um, and so there's an opportunity to accept that invitation uh, and kind of to step into that. Mm. I, I think in terms of you said, like, what are we maybe not doing? I think there's maybe, uh, 
a challenge around the black and whites and the grays, right? Young people in these situations. And sometimes what contributes to homelessness is the black and whites. It's the, right. actually, hey, you're not living in the way that I think you should. You're not making the choices I think mm -hmm. you should. And so we're going to allow you to go through this. Like actually loving young people um, who have gone through significant trauma and harm and been abused and have gone through just horrendous things, it requires an ability to love through those gray spaces. And that it's not mm -hmm. always going to look the way you think it, that it should do. Um, and so I think that's something that we can wrestle with. I would like to to just on on the back of that say I think one of the things that I find when I come across Christians um, who are like, yes, we will get involved or whatever, but they have the kind of proviso in their head that mm. they will love this young person into being a Christian. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> you yeah, may yeah. not actually see them ever come to faith. Mm. And that yeah. shouldn't stop the amount of love that you have for them, yeah, yeah, knowing yeah. that they may never become a Christian. Mm. Um, yeah. and, and I think for me, that was the biggest challenge in, in working with young people and standing in that gray space between the church and the young people um, was that the church was like, oh, yes, well, we'll let them in and we'll make them go to youth group and we'll make them read the Bible. And we'll make, and, and it's like, actually, they're still able to make that choice to Jesus for mm. themselves. And they're far more likely to do it if you just love them where they're at, mm -hmm. but they're also okay. You know, it's also okay if they, they don't ever make that, like we can pray for yeah. them for the rest of their lives, but that's their choice. Mm -hmm. And we have to mm -hmm. be okay with that. And that isn't, should not be the end goal mm -hmm. of, of loving them. That yeah. loving them mm -hmm. should be the end goal in itself. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's... you've come across that much AJ, but I came across it. A yeah, lot I, and I, it drove me I, th <laughs> I, I think it's, um, I think it's pretty common, and, and I think again, it's, it's it's part of the way that we're kind of trained and, and inducted in our in our church context. Mm. Um, but I think something that I kind of uh, believe is is if we're putting preconditions on our love, I don't think that is love. You know, yeah, if I've got an ulterior right. motive to love you, then I'm not loving you. Mm. Um, I think that's something for us to step back and just check ourselves on. Mm. You know, when we're stepping into these spaces. Um, and also that's also the way that you get hurt you know that's the way that you give mm. up and you burn out because mm. if, if you're serving people because you're some sort of savior that thinks that you can you know mm. change their lives um then you're going to find out really quickly that that's not reality um yeah. one of my favorite quotes and I, i'm going to mess up the quote but basically um uh and i always forget who said this but basically it's this concept around hey look if you think that um you're here to save me then like go away like i don't need you but if you recognize that you know our liberation is bound together then come down here and let's work together and i mm -hmm. tell you what um i get just as much out of you know i i, I feel like i've become more human and in, in that i've learned more about what it means to be human to be yeah. to learn more what it means to love what it, what mm -hmm. it means to actually know god through serving um the young people that I care about. Right. Mm. Mm. And, and this isn't about, and again, I think you, you sort of mentioned before around all the different things that I do. Um, at the root of this is that I know these young people, they're not just some statistic or some mm. person. Yeah, like I know yeah. their names, I know their faces, mm. I know their stories and they know mine and, and we connected, you know, we're brothers and sisters. We, there's, there's solidarity there. Um, mm. And so that's far more real. And so mm. the, and I think that's that's another thing. I think a challenge for the church is sometimes we miss stepping into solidarity because of alternative mo motives. And I, and I know, yeah. like intellectually, we think, oh, we want to get this person saved because we save them next, you know, over there. But but we miss this invitation into deep relationship, mm -hmm. into deep solidarity, mm -hmm. um, and we miss actually what God's going to do in our lives by actually opening ourselves up mm -hmm. to those relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 one, I like one... to. Oh, sorry, so sorry, Jared. Christine. Or, uh, no, I was just going to say, like, one way I've heard about churches talking about this, helpfully, people churches that are engaging in this space, is thinking in terms of their soteriology. Are you a, uh, are you a believe, become, belong church, or are you a belong, uh, become, believe church? You know, mm. like, actually, in terms of what's the starting point? Does someone mm. have to believe first before they belong mm -hmm. or do they already belong just by actually coming mm -hmm. to the church you know are they already invited mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, th I think something I'm curious to ask you about there is 
think of it like a siren call you know like you know rounding off and 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 connected to what uh christine may want to say hopefully maybe differently <laughs> but is this idea of for the 21st century church in Aotearoa, but maybe more widely as well like why is social justice important in our epoch in our era um and what mm. key biblical ideas do you see as being connected or neglected you talked a little bit about it with the idea of the divine dream or love is the way mm. yeah I, I just wonder if, if there's anything else you want to further add to to clarify to to summarize or to add on to what you've already said yeah um when i look at the gospels i think one of the real clear images we see um I mean, it's rooted really in the incarnation, right? You know, so so God came into this world as a baby, but not, but not just as a baby. You know, he came as one of the poor, you know, one of the marginalized. He came as a Jew in a land that had been colonized. Um, he, he was on the extreme margins of his society. Um, and he lived in such a way uh, that called those who had been cast to the side um, into relationship, into community. And he said, look, the world doesn't have to be this way. And he started to live as if, you know, as if a different one was possible. And I think that image and that that sort of framing of of the divine as not just with the poor, but of the poor, I think is really something for us to wrestle with. Another key text that kind of I find like really um, transformational in my life was really the, the study of the rich young ruler. You know, one of the things I think we all kind of fall into is kind of when we read the scriptures, um, seeing ourselves as the Jew, you know, seeing ourselves as the oppressed in the story. Um, yeah, one of the things that I, I guess I kind of hold is like I'm Pakia, you know, I come from a context and a community and a background which has, you know, participated in systems of oppression. And, and some of the, the privileges that I've had in my life have come from that background. Um, you know, if anything, if I look at the scriptures, I'm the Roman soldier, I'm the rich young ruler. Um, and yet Jesus says, come follow me, you know, give up, you know, your power, your privilege, your wealth, whatever that is, lay it down and follow me. Um, come into solidarity with me, you know, Christ who is poor and marginalized and on the margins of society and, and journey with me as we dream this divine dream together. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think it's a, it's, it's part of the faith, you know, I think it's a real core to what jesus is doing in the world it's it's not just about you know some core moral um you know ideas and sort of uh, a head theology but actually you know the gospel was that god's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven you know mm -hmm. that that was something that was becoming reality as jesus was walking through the world and so we're invited to join in that work of bringing god's kingdom um to earth Wow. Mm. Mate, you always make me think. Like, yeah, always make me think. It's mm. um it's good. You are a very you're very good at taking very complex and and often very hard to um yeah, just complex complex ideas and structures and things and making it um framing it in a new way that makes me think um oh, and challenging my views yeah mm. it's I, I love it this is why i read your stuff even even like you know even though it's like it's yeah sometimes i disagree sometimes i agree it's it always mm. makes me think um and mm. makes me try and reframe how i've thought about stuff and i love that um i think that's something we really need um mm -hmm. from people like you mm. is to to reframe stuff for us and make us think um Thank you so much Thank for so coming much. on with us. Yeah. Like we've taken up so much of your time and yeah. you're not uh, like, so you don't, you don't have a lot of spare time. So thank your wife and kids from us as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because we do not underestimate how much the family sacrifice for mm. things like this. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here and thank you for doing the work that you do and challenging people and, and speaking up and being a voice for the voiceless. I think it's really important. Um, and a, and a, a christian voice as well is really mm. cool um mm. you know and and i feel like you know for for me and for other people hopefully listening to this that even um that we we can learn when we have people that we 
feel uncomfortable sometimes with the gray or with what something that they've said mm -hmm. that we can actually see the heart of that person and be grateful for what they do anyway um mm -hmm. which i think in in this world of keyboard warriors doesn't happen very often <laughs> um you know yeah. like we we're very quick to judge and jump on and and rip apart and mm. often we just need to be grateful for the fact that somebody is doing the work um mm. you know and that is fantastic so mm. yeah we would like to pray for you um mm. is there anything in particular that you are currently working on or you know that you would like prayer for or you know like your family or anything like that because we would love to just lift you up in prayer and as our brother yeah yeah i mean probably just all of it you know we're really, really working <laughs> the, this this year uh especially this year we, we're trying to really highlight um this election year um mm. we're really trying to highlight the the situation our young people are kind of experiencing and, and trying to get a national conversation around that um to to put some pressure on our decision makers to to, to get some urgent action in this so yeah that's probably mm. something you're keeping your press mm. yeah, oh absolutely. and additionally as well like uh we said uh, a little earlier in the podcast, uh, AJ, mm. is there anything you'd like to plug at this point and actually say, you know, a cause you want people to get behind? Yeah. 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 I mean, um, yeah, I talked about youth homelessness. We have a petition on Action Station, so you can go there um, and just look up youth homelessness New Zealand in, in Google and you'll find that. So if you want to sign and share that, get that out there. Um, we're hoping to deliver that petition this year. Um, I mean, if you're interested in my work, you know, you can find me on sort of socials, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, AJ Hendry. Um, and I, I write for a Substack called When Lambs Are Silent, um, which is, is mostly sort of my political justice sort of reflections. Um, and more recently, I've started a, a Substack called uh, Letters from the Revolution, uh, which is which is maybe more directed around sort of faith, particularly. And When Lambs Are Silent, I, I try to, when I do speak of faith, it's more public theology and trying to engage um in a way that others outside the church can kind of engage with mm. but in letters from the revolution i'm kind of just being a bit more real um mm. so yeah cool mm. um yeah i was gonna ask um tony would you like to pray you've you've been yeah. sitting there quietly just, <clears throat> no just i'm um, just on action station now yeah um, we'll put all the links in below this podcast yeah, that we'll aj's do. mentioned we'll yeah do. yeah might want to just go on there and edit it to the right honourable uh, somebody else rather than yes, yes, up. that's that's <laughs> changed recently, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Looked at that for a little while. <laughs> just to point that out, but yeah, no worries. Anyway, uh, I'll pray that you'll have time to do that and many other things. So uh, let's get it going. Thank you, Lord, for your great love and that you step down into this dark world but this dark world has not overcome your life. Lord, I pray for AJ, for his wife, for his children, uh, for the house, uh, <laughs> everybody in the house, the whole clan, <laughs> Lord. I pray for, for grace, uh, for, for peace, uh, for solidarity, Lord, that word, solidarity and and for your presence in that place as they journey together lord i pray for his uh for the kingdom come in his ministry that he would see you move and that he would follow in your footsteps empowered by your love mm. and empowered by your desire to transform your creation mm. we hand this whole podcast and and the journey ahead for each and every one of us over to you we pray this in the mighty name of Christ. Amen. 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 Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Tim. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank Bless you, you, brother. Been a yeah. pleasure. Been a privilege. Been a delight. Hey, no, I'm enjoying it. Thanks. Thank, thanks for having me. Awesome. I appreciate Good. it. No worries. We might have you on again sometime to pick apart <laughs> politics and we'll theology. Love it. <laughs> we'll love it. <laughs> love to be back. Cool. All right. Have a great night, man. Love to you, Father. Bless you. Yeah. Kakite. Cool. Kakite. Cheers. Thank you.